Good morning and welcome to Washington Hebrew Congregation. I'm Rabbi Susan Shankman. I'm delighted to be here this morning and it gives me great pride to welcome you to Washington Hebrew Congregation's Amram Scholar Series, both those of you who are sitting in our small chapel as well as those of you who are joining us via live stream. The Amram Scholar Series, as many of you know, offers a stimulating program of free lectures throughout the year in which world-renowned speakers, authors, scholars, political leaders, policy analysts, and theologians share their perspectives on timely issues or their research into history. The program traces its beginnings to the fall of 1954 when the congregation moved to our Macomb Street home. That fall, participating in a nationwide celebration marking the 300th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, Washington Hebrew launched what would become this widely recognized Sunday morning lecture program. We are grateful to the Jewish Book Council for their partnership with today's lecture and want to remind you that following the conclusion of our program, you will be able to purchase books uh, in the rabbinic atrium. And I will also share that at the outset, uh, I'll share at the outset that at the conclusion of this morning's program, both Ambassador Indic and I will be leaving promptly, hopefully, to, uh, to go and speak at a rally for saving Israel's democracy, which is taking place at the Israeli embassy. Uh, we hope that some of you or many of you will join us there as well, and I'm sure you'll be inspired after hearing his remarks to do so. Today's Amram le lecture is sponsored by the Dr. Allen and Catherine Schwartzberg Jewish Studies Endowment Fund. Dr. Allen and Catherine Schwartzberg of blessed memory made Jewish contributions to the advancement of mental health treatment, biblical archaeology, Jewish history, the Holocaust, and the history and culture of Israel. And they not only had a love for Israel themselves, but they passed and transmitted that love for Israel onto their children as well, Rob and Shauna, who are here with us. Dr. Allen and Catherine Schwartzberg were both involved here at Washington Hebrew Congregation in a number of ways. And in fact, in 1966, the year I believe that Shauna was consecrated here at Washington Hebrew, Dr. Schwartzberg spoke at the WHC Saturday Parents Institute on the topic of communication problems in adolescence. And we're grateful to Shauna and Rob who are here with us for their continued support of the Amram Scholar Series and also in particular for enhancing our bagels with Lou, Lou Wiener, our president, uh, who we're also grateful to. And I know many of you enjoyed that prior to the program. And we look forward to future opportunities as uh, Rob shared with the ambassador before our, uh, our program began. This is a lecture that their parents would surely have, have been at. They would have bought the book. It would have been added to their extensive collection, which Rob now holds on to. Uh, and certainly would have inspired the lessons that they've transmitted to their children, uh, which we continue to share and, uh, and share that va the values and that love for Israel with our congregation. So we are so grateful to the Schwarzberg family for, for being here, for their continued support. We are also thankful to our moderator this morning, Dan Werner, who is a member of our executive committee and vice president of Washington Hebrew Congregation. A WHC member since 1983, Dan was a reporter, producer, and associate executive producer of the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and then president of McNeil Lehrer Productions. At WHC, among other volunteer tasks, Dan served as longtime vice chair of the Amram Scholar Series, and we're thankful to him for stepping back into that role this morning. And I see that his chair, who he long longtime partner, both in the Amram Scholar Series and in life, Leslie Maitland, our, our former uh, lead uh, and chair of our Amram Scholar Series is here as well. And so welcome, Leslie. We're grateful to both of them. <laughs> we are thrilled our speaker, this, we are thrilled to welcome our speaker, Ambassador Martin Indyk, back to Washington Hebrew Congregation. Martin S. Indyk is currently the Lowy Distinguished Fellow in U.S. Middle East Diplomacy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Previously, he served as Executive Vice President of the Brookings Institution, and prior to that as the Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, and the founder of its Center for Middle East Policy. He was also the founding Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Ambassador Indyk entered government service in 1993 as Special Assistant to President Bill Clinton, 
and Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Israel from 1995 to 1997, and again from 2000 to 2001. In between, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. In July 2013, President Obama appointed him as the U.S. Special Envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian Negotiations, a position he held until July 2014. Ambassador Indyk is the author of Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy, which we remind you you'll be able to purchase following our program, and also Innocent Abroad, an intimate account of American peace diplomacy in the Middle East, and the co-author of Bending History, Barack Obama's Foreign Policy with Michael O'Hanlon and Kenneth Lieberthal. When we, uh, when we scheduled this many, many months ago, last summer, we could not have imagined where we would be in our relationship with Israel and, and having that foresight. I, it's, I will take it as Leslie and I just had the, the genius and the foresight to, to plan this for right now in this moment, but really it could not come at a more opportune time uh, for us to be able to, to hear from you and to have this conversation, and we are so grateful to, to have you back at Washington Hebrew Congregation. Ambassador Martin Indyk. Thank you very much, Rabbi Shankman. It's great to be back here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Rob and Shana Schwartzberg for uh, giving me the opportunity to honor the memory of their parents, uh, Alan and Catherine Schwartzberg, with this uh, uh, event today. Uh, as I uh, sat here listening uh, to the rabbi, uh, I couldn't help but think back to the first time I was in this room which was roughly 30 years ago uh, when we, I moved with my family from Sydney, Australia uh, to Washington, D.C. And uh, we lived at 4200 Massachusetts Avenue just across the road there. And so Washington Hebrew was the natural uh, place for us to come and celebrate our first uh, high holidays here in, in Washington. Not just the first, but but that's when we started about uh, 30 years ago, 1983. So uh, it's great to be back, and it's great to see so many of our good friends here uh, as well. 50 years ago, uh, like today, Israel's fate was hanging in the balance. Uh, sounds rather dramatic about events today, but... Uh, the defence minister last night, as some of you may have seen, the Israeli defence minister, and, and pr previous to that, in the last week, when uh, Gail, my wife, and I were in Israel, uh, the former head of the Israel Atomic Energy Commission, the former head of the Mossad, the former head of the Shin Bet, all spoke out about the dire threat to Israel's existence, quote-unquote, uh, by the push of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government for the judicial revolution that is causing such upheaval in, in Israel today. Fifty years ago, Israel's fate hung in the balance for a different reason. As many of you will recall, October uh, 1973, on Yom Kippur, uh, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack uh, on Israel. And at that moment, uh, is, it looked as if uh, Israel's fate was hanging in the balance again. Uh, I happened to be in Israel at that time, uh, a student at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem when the war broke out. And I was uh, there uh, worrying about Israel's future, my own future, and, and watching as first the United States Air Force uh, undertook a massive military supply effort. We see the similar kind of thing happening in Ukraine today, uh, which helped Israel turn the tide of battle. And then I watched as Secretary of State Henry Kissinger uh, negotiated, first of all, a ceasefire between Israel, Egypt, and Israel and Syria, and then went on to negotiate two agreements 
uh, between Israel and Egypt, uh, one between Israel and Syria, the first agreements between Israel and any Arab country since its founding, uh, and thereby laid the foundations for the American-led peace process um, that is in so much trouble today. He was very successful in his efforts. Uh, he managed through the two disengagement agreements between Israel and Egypt to take, effectively to take Israel, uh, Egypt out of the war with Israel. Egypt being the largest militarily and most powerful Arab state on Israel's borders, taking Egypt out of the conflict meant it was impossible for any of the other Arab states to conceive of making war on Israel again. So it transformed the nature of the Arab-Israeli conflict. His agreement between Israel and Syria, the 1974 Golan Heights disengagement agreement, few people remember it today, but for 50 years it has served to ensure that the Golan Heights is the most peaceful of Israel's borders. There's been barely an incident on the Golan Heights in 50 years since Kissinger negotiated that agreement, uh, notwithstanding the descent of Syria into civil war. And so uh, I decided to write uh, this book about Kissinger's diplomacy. Uh, when I uh, was involved in the last effort to try to make peace between Israel and the Palestinians. That was in 2013, 2014, when I was Barack Obama's special envoy for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, working under Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, and that effort, uh, the last effort to uh, negotiate between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it's hard to remember that there hasn't been an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation since then. Uh, in almost 10 years. And uh, that effort failed. Like all of the efforts since uh, Camp David II uh, in the year 2000 had failed, notwithstanding the attempt by four presidents, including, of course, President Trump with his deal of the century, to try to resolve this uh, conflict. And so, having been involved uh, at that point in three efforts uh, under President Clinton with Yitzhak Rabin, under President Clinton again with Ehud Barak, and he became Prime Minister, and, and then under President Obama. Uh, having been involved in, in those three efforts, all of which failed, I decided that rather than write a book about why we failed, I'd write a book about why Kissinger succeeded and see if I could learn and um, from that effort uh, spread the, uh, the wisdom that I could glean uh, from Kissinger's diplomacy uh, to learn how to and how not to make peace uh, in the Middle East. And so that's what, what uh, the book is about. Uh, the there's no absence of books by or about Henry Kissinger. Um, but surprisingly, there is no book uh, that had been written before on Kissinger's Middle East diplomacy. Uh, he is, of course, known for uh, detente with the Soviet Union, the breakthrough opening of relations with China, uh, and a few other notorious things like the... Uh, peace negotiations with Vietnam or uh, the overthrow of the Allende regime in Chile or the war uh, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, nobody uh, focused on his uh, efforts in the Middle East. Uh, perhaps it's because they were so successful. I'm not sure. But uh, the advantage of, of time is that Kissinger, as a man of history and a student of history, kept uh, meticulous notes on every conversation he had and every negotiation he had. By the way, just in parentheses, he also took all of his papers with him when he left uh, government, 
case you're concerned about <laughs> Joe Biden's handling of classified documents and Donald Trump's handling of classified documents. Kissinger took them all. <laughs> Hundreds of boxes of classified <laughs> documents that were then uh, held by his lawyers. Uh, but all of those documents are in the National Archives now and in, in the Yale University Library in the Kissinger Papers. And 98% of them have been declassified, so it's all there. Plus, the Israeli archives have been uh, opened for that period, so it's possible to, to uh, get the Israeli version. Uh, always very important when you're dealing with Henry Kissinger to have a, a way of checking uh, the record. Uh, and and uh, I was privileged to have the opportunity to interview Kissinger in detail after every chapter, I would sit with him and, and uh, talk about what I'd learned from, from the record. And even though he's 100 years old in a couple of months, he remembers details of what happened 50 years ago. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't remember what happened last year. Um, but he, he remembers well. He's written three, two books last year and another one coming this year. Uh, so he's a, he's a phenomenon. Uh, not just for his diplomacy, but for his memory and uh, physique. So uh, as a result of that, I could tell a story that uh, was accurate and, um, and reveal a whole history of what actually happened during those, those days and then try to illuminate that story with my own experiences, uh, often following in his footsteps uh, dealing with some of the same leaders that he dealt with, Yitzhak Rabin in particular, and, and Hafez al-Assad of Syria and, and King Hussein of Jordan, who were still around uh, 30 years later when I was involved. And, and in that process, try to take the reader uh, behind the doors to explain and illuminate uh, what happens when American diplomats uh, sully forth into the uh, bazaars and palaces and prime minister's offices of, of the Middle East and we try in our naivete and arrogance to resolve uh, the conflicts there. So uh, what did I learn? Um, the most interesting thing for me and, and the most surprising um, because I should say I, I wrote my PhD dissertation on the role of, of the United States in, in Middle East peacemaking and Kissinger played a big role in that. But I did not understand then as a result of my studies and I certainly did not understand as a result of my efforts to help President Clinton, Secretary of State Kerry and President Obama make peace. Uh, I did not understand Kissinger's approach to peacemaking. And part of the reason for that was that Kissinger himself obfuscated what he was actually up to. Uh, and it, that's even true in his 10,000-page, uh, uh, three-volume uh, history of his uh, efforts uh, in the Nixon and Ford administrations. Uh, obfuscating because he operated in an anti-Semitic White House under Richard Nixon and in an anti-Israel environment when he went over uh, and became Secretary of State. And so he was constantly playing a game, not only with the leaders of, of Israel and the Arab states, but with his own bosses and his own staff. Uh, but in the documents themselves, what comes through time and time again is that when the leaders he was dealing with, Anwar Sadat, not Golda Meir, I'll come back to her in a moment, but Yitzhak Rabin and Hafez al-Assad, even Hafez al-Assad, uh, they would say to him from time to time in these negotiations, we're ready to make peace. Our people are ready. Let's take the big step. Let's end the conflict. And Kissinger would constantly back them off and say, that's not a good idea. That's too risky. 
We need to go for something less. We need to go for small steps, not the big step. We need an incremental approach. He called it, some of you may recall, step-by-step -step diplomacy. Why was that? Uh, I, in order to understand it, I went back uh, to his writings as a professor of, of history at Harvard University and, and subsequently. And I found the answer in the very first book that he wrote, which was his PhD dissertation. It's called, the published version is called A World Restored, Kissinger and Metternich and the Problems of Peace. It was kind of there in the title, The Problems of Peace. You might ask, what does that have to do with peacemaking in the Middle East? But what he revealed there was based on his study of the post-Napoleonic War order established by the Austrian and British foreign ministers, Metternich and Castlereagh, that, that that order depended in large part on not trying to end the conflicts, but rather trying to ameliorate them by establishing a balance of power in favour of the powers at that time, particularly Austria and, and Great Britain, those powers who were committed to maintaining order and the status quo in post-Napoleonic Europe. Uh, and that effort to maintain an order rather than achieve peace was something that captured Kissinger's imagination. Why? Kissinger himself, as you probably know, was a, a, a refugee from the Holocaust. 13 of his immediate family were, were murdered by the Nazis. He fled with his immediate father and mother and brother from, from Firth in, in Germany, outside of Nuremberg, to uh, New York. City. Uh, but he had experienced in Nazi Germany the chaos and the insecurity uh, that that era produced. Uh, and, and then he'd witnessed uh, the way in which appeasement before the Second World War had actually led to the rise of Nazism and, and the breakdown of the pre-World War II international order. And so seeking order in his own life to escape the chaos of that time, he came to be mightily attracted to order in the international system. And at the same time came to be deeply sceptical of the idea that you could make peace and end conflicts. After all, the peace to end all peace after the First World War led directly to the Second World War. And so he much preferred the 19th century European order, which had kept the peace more or less for 100 years before it broke down. And, and so that, when it came to the Middle East, that's what he was trying to recreate take European order and put it into the Middle East. You would say that can't possibly work, but you know what it did. In particular, between Israel and Syria, as I said before, maintain, has maintained the peace there for 50 years. Uh, and of course, his efforts led to the Israel-Egypt uh, peace treaty that Jimmy Carter uh, negotiated two years after Kissinger left office. But because he was focused on creating order rather than achieving peace, he was much less ambitious, much more conservative than the American diplomats, presidents, secretaries of state who came after him. We were all enamoured with the idea that we could resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. Nobel Peace Prizes were in the offing. 
And uh, you think I'm joking. It was <laughs> that was very much part of the, uh, the, the attraction. Uh, and not just to Donald Trump. But uh, Kissinger's attitude was the exact opposite that this was really dangerous, that the pursuit of peace with too much passion and commitment by American presidents and their advisers could lead to the opposite. And that's what he wrote on the first page of this first book, that the pursuit of peace often leads to its opposite, that is to say, war. And that informed his approach. Of course, <coughs> The balance of power had to be maintained in favour of uh, those countries, like Israel and Iran in Kissinger's day, that had an interest in maintaining stability. But he came to understand after the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973 that it wasn't enough. That the Arab states had to have a stake in maintaining the order. And the only way that was going to happen was if they had a way forward through diplomacy to achieve the return of the territory, the Arab territory that Israel had occupied as a result of the 1967 Six Day War. That is to say, all of the Sinai leading up to the Suez Canal, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. And so Kissinger introduced a peace process, process not the pursuit of peace itself, so as to legitimise the order that he was creating and give the Arabs a stake in it. So Kissinger's process required a territorial component. In other words, Israel had to be prepared to give up some territory in order that the Arabs would have an interest in maintaining the order. Kissinger believed that eventually this process would lead to peace. But he didn't expect it in his time in office. In fact, he expected it would take decades for it to occur. And, and that's why he never aimed for it. He simply aimed for arrangements. I say simply, it wasn't so simple. But, but arrangements that would help to bolster the order and create time. Time for Israel to strengthen itself with the support of the United States, to reduce its isolation. Time for the Arabs to come to terms with Israel's existence and finally to reconcile with, with it. It was not territory for peace. That's what we, we were into, we who came after him. It was territory for time because he didn't believe in peace. And, and that was what he managed to sell to the Israelis and, and to the Arabs. Uh, in particular, he sold it to Golda, and I go into details about how he made this argument. And, and uh, he was ultimately successful, but it was a hell of an effort, a knockdown, drag out fight. But he succeeded. And as a result of that, Territory for time became the foundational principle of Israel's negotiating strategy because Israeli leaders too were sceptical of Arab intentions. Uh, so when I finished this book, I, I went to interview Kissinger for one last time. And I said to him, you know, I'm surprised when I look at the record of your negotiations that you didn't go for the Israel-Egypt peace treaty that Jimmy Carter negotiated two years after you left office, uh, in large part because of your efforts. He was a, Carter was able to succeed at that. And I said, you know, I, I look at the, at the documentation, it's clear that Sadat was ready when you were negotiating with him, and Rabin was ready. Uh, and I asked him, did you ever regret not, not doing that? And he said, no. He said, I was very glad it happened. But if I had been Secretary of State 
under President Ford if he had been re-elected instead of Jimmy Carter. He said, I would not have gone for the peace that Carter went for. I would have gone for another step. Uh, Non-belligerency on uh, Egypt's part and another territorial step in the Sinai. And I asked him why. He said, because I always feared that if we pushed it too hard, I would break it. And that, you know, for me was a revelation uh, because I understood then, in that moment, that that's exactly what we had done at Camp David II in 2000. When, under pressure from Israel's Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Barak, uh, who wanted to end the conflict and have a conflict-ending negotiation and a, a negotiation to end all claims, and persuaded Clinton, because he was in his last year in office, that this was the time to go for it. And, kiss, and Clinton pressured Arafat, who said he was not ready. Who said he was not ready to end the conflict and end the claims. But Barack and Clinton insisted. They slept Arafat to Camp David and pushed him really hard. And he said no. You can go into that if you want to. But uh, I was the subject of another book that I wrote. Uh, and uh, Arafat said no. And we failed in that effort. Exactly in Christensen's words, we pushed it too hard and we broke it. And the Intifada broke out within a few months raged for five years, killed thousands of Israelis and Palestinians, and in the process destroyed all of the trust between their leaders and all of the trust between their people. And like Humpty Dumpty, all the king's horses and all the king's men and all the American diplomats have been unable to put it back together again. So that the Palestinians and Israelis today remain mired in conflict <coughs> with a high potential for it to break out into a third intifada in this coming month of Ramadan and, and Pesach. Uh, and, and that, I believe, is a, a direct result of knowing not Kissinger. Realizing, not realising that the pursuit of peace with too much passion and ambition actually led to its opposite. So let me leave it there and uh, be glad to uh, take your questions. I have to say by way of preview, reading this book is the equivalent of reading a mystery where you know what the outcome is, but you're still a page turner. We know what's gonna happen, but it is, it's an extraordinary, well-written and terrifically exciting read. Uh, and thank you very much for your talk. During a number of times in the book, you, you make the point that Kissinger, the old Harvard professor, was teaching the people he was negotiating with. And what did you mean by that? And how did he manage to teach the negotiators? So Kissinger, of course, uh, was a Harvard professor before he became a diplomat uh, and had a uh, very strong sense of history uh, as a result of not just his own life experience but, but as a result of um, his study of history. Uh, and so he was quite... In his, in his approach to dealing with leaders, he was quite professorial. And he would begin by giving his account of the state of the world. Uh, and I think it's important to remember uh, when he started his efforts uh, with the Israelis and Arabs in 1973, he had already been national security advisor to Nixon. He had by then already achieved the breakthrough to China and detente with the Soviet Union and uh, strategic arms limitation agreements. 
Uh, and he was a huge uh, celebrity. I don't know whether any of you have watched that Netflix series called The Offer. Which is, if you haven't, you should watch it. It's the story of uh, the, dra the drama of, of the making of the movie The Godfather. And there at the end, the, with the preview of The Godfather, the producers of, of The Godfather insisted that Henry Kissinger be there for the, pre, for the opening of The Godfather. Um, he was that much of a celebrity. And he, he, in, the, in the, <laughs> the series, he, he puts off a, a trip to uh, Moscow in order to be at the opening of the, of the Godfather. I asked Henry whether that was true, and he said, yes, it was. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so i just give you the sense. He had celebrity girlfriends. He was, he was a superstar. He appeared on the... And the year that he did his diplomacy, he appeared on the, the front cover of Time magazine four times. Uh, so for him to swan in to Cairo or Jerusalem or, or uh, even into Riyadh to meet with the Dower King uh, Faisal of Saudi Arabia, uh, they were all completely dazzled uh, by him. Hafiz al-Assad used to have these excruciatingly long meetings with Kissinger just so he could advertise how much time he'd managed to spend with the, <laughs> with the great man. So with this aura of, of, you know, around him, he, uh, he could then kind of explain to them their historical role, his own historical role, and, and that would set the context for making them feel that they were involved in something great and therefore are elevating their aspirations to, to join him in, their, in, in his endeavours uh, in a way that I think was important, I wouldn't say critical, but was important to his uh, ability to move them to places that they didn't want to go, which is the art of his uh, diplomacy. Okay. Uh it's an urban myth that the uh, Yom Kippur War was a surprise attack, uh, that the Egyptians and the uh, Syrians took the opportunity to surprise the Israelis uh, with their attack. Was it a surprise? Should it have been a surprise? And who knew about it in advance or should have known about it in advance? Well, it's an interesting question, um, one that I've never had in, in a year and a half of talking about the book, so I appreciate it. <laughs> um, it, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was definitely a surprise to the Israelis and Kissinger that, that Egypt and Syria would uh, launch, would have the, the uh, guts to take the risk of launching war against Israel. Because their conception, and it was a common conception of Israeli leaders, Israeli intelligence chiefs, uh, the CIA, and therefore Henry Kissinger as well. They all believed that the Arabs would not dare to attack Israel because Israel was stronger. Israel had defeated them uh, soundly in 1967. And the United States was providing Israel with military backup, and the Soviet Union, under detente with the United States, was supposedly not providing with the Arabs, the Arabs with the same means of attacking Israel. That turned out not to be exactly true, but that was the assumption. So what you had was a conception that they would never attack. And because of that conception, the intelligence which came through are uh, was discounted. Sadat's warnings repeatedly in public that if he wasn't able to get his land back through diplomacy, he was going to go to war, uh, simply uh, were ignored uh, or dismissed. Kissinger admits that he regarded Sadat as a buffoon, as some character out of the opera Aida, uh, because of that assumption. And so even though they got intelligence, and in particular they got intelligence from 
from their top, the Israelis got intelligence from their top spy who was in Anwar Sadat's office. Um, again, you can watch a Netflix movie about him. It's called The Angel. Uh, <laughs> and they got early uh, warning about 24 hours before that, that the war was coming. And they got warning from King Hussein of, of Jordan that the war was coming. Uh, they did not take it seriously. So it, it, even though it should not have been a surprise, it turned out to be a surprise. How did uh, Anwar Sadat convince Kissinger he was not a buffoon? By going to war. <laughs> uh, no, that's what it took. And it's interesting because Kissinger, I th he had an inkling that it was possible that the Egyptians would, would launch war. Uh, part of the reason for that, and I detail it in, in uh, the book, is that Sadat sent him his national security advisor on a secret mission in February of 1973. War broke out in October. And Hafez, Hafez Ismail, Sadat's national security advisor, came to America. They actually met in New, Mo New York, in Armonk, New York outside of uh, New York City. Some of you know where it is. Uh, in a safe house, a CIA safe house. Why did they do that? Because Kissinger was trying to keep it secret from the State Department <laughs> that he was actually meeting with the Egyptian. Uh, and and Hafez Ismail came with a uh, detailed peace initiative from Sadat. And uh, Kissinger was quite interested in this and reported to Nixon that this, was, this held some promise. But he then sat down with the Israeli ambassador of the time, a guy named Yitzhak Rabin. And Rabin, in his classic way that I came to understand and, and experience, uh, sat there, listened to Kissinger's briefing on this peace initiative and dismissed it completely said, it's nothing, we've heard it all before, there's nothing new here. Kissinger was quite defensive and said, well, it may not be new to you, but it's new to me. But then Golda, mayor, came to town and dismissed it as well, and Nixon and Kissinger decided to just, to just drop it. Uh, but I think Kissinger understood from then that, that he was missing an opportunity and, in fact, planned in October after what was then supposed to be an Israeli election, that he would take it up. He felt he couldn't do anything before then. They had a second meeting, Hafez Ismail and Henry Kissinger, in May. And Hafez Ismail warns Kissinger that if this diplomacy doesn't move forward, you know, Sadat will go to war. And there is a walk in the, in the woods at the end of their negotiation, which we don't have a record of, we have other people reporting about it. But it appears, I don't want to underline appears, that Kissinger told Hafez Ismail, we only respond to crises. Uh, so it, it's in, in fact possible that Kissinger understood that it was going to blow and started to think about then what he was going to do if it did. Because as soon as it blew, as soon as the war broke out, Kissinger moved. He knew exactly what he was going to do in the most, most um, effective way, which I detail in the book, to negotiate a ceasefire and lay the foundations for a peace process that would make war between Israel and Egypt impossible. Okay, I, one last question before you all, we throw it open for questions. Uh, Kissinger seemed, as you, as you report, Kissinger had a, under, an early understanding back in the early 1970s of the power of the Palestine Liberation Organization, which was just getting formed and was very much a terrorist organization. But he saw where it might go. Uh, King Hussein, at the same time, was pleading for American engagement in coming up with a peace treaty between Jordan and Israel. Uh, what happened? 
Um, Kissinger had had no time for non-state actors. Kissinger's world was in was a world of states, and there was a hierarchy of states: the superpowers, the regional powers, the smaller powers, and it was the superpowers uh, that decided what happened in his world order. Uh, so the Palestinians were a terrorist organization. They weren't a state. And, and they were, for him, a nuisance. A, pr a problem, yes. But from his point of view, it was a problem that Israel and Jordan should deal with, not the United States. It didn't rise to the level of superpower engagement. He did engage in a, in a dialogue with the PLO once he started the peace process through the CIA through Vernon Walters, who was deputy director of the CIA at the time. And they did have a number of, of uh, meetings. But the PLO, Arafat's representatives, made clear that their objective was to overthrow uh, King Hussein of Jordan. And so that was just another reason for, for Kissinger not to deal with them. As you, as you said, the record shows that the King of Jordan wanted his own disengagement agreement with Israel. Uh, as you probably know, King Hussein did not participate in the 1973 war because he had lost so much of his territory, all of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. In the 67 war, he was kind of given a pass by Sadat and Assad. But in the aftermath of the war, he pressed Kissinger to do a disengagement negotiation with Jordan after Kissinger had done the first one with Egypt and then with Syria. And in retrospect, it's always easier in retrospect, it's, it's clear that had Kissinger embarked on that effort, uh, it would have been possible to get an agreement in which Jordan would come back into the West Bank would have a foothold there in Jericho and, and a corridor into Ramallah. Uh, and, and that that would have given Jordan agency over the Palestinians in the, in the West Bank. The king made clear he wanted to do it. The Israelis made clear that they were willing to engage. In fact, uh, Golda had a series of secret negotiations with the king in a Winnebago in the Arava Valley uh, that I detail in the book. But uh, Kissinger himself said to both Golda and King Hussein, and then subsequently when Golda left office and Rabin became prime minister, said it to him as well. This is your problem. I'm not going to press you. I really recommend that you do something about it, that you take that you try to, to resolve it yourselves, but I'm not going to get involved. And, and so he missed the opportunity. By the way, he admits this in his memoirs. He admits that he, that he missed this opportunity. And within six months of the uh, failure of that effort, and Kissinger went off and negotiated the second agreement between Israel and Egypt, the Arabs, the Arab leaders came together uh, in Rabat, Morocco, and declared that the PLO was the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinians, and that put paid to any role for Jordan. And if you think about it, if Jordan had had a foothold in the West Bank and had managed to, to regain its influence over the Palestinians, the uh, fate of the Palestinians I think would have been quite different. Of course, it's a counterfactual. But what the Palestinians lacked was the institutions of statehood. And they lacked a, a, a state-based anchor for the commitments that they themselves did not keep, both because they didn't feel obliged to and didn't have the capability to do so. In every other case where Israel's made agreements, it's been with states, and those Arab states, whether it's Egypt or Syria or Jordan, 
or now the Abraham Accords countries, those states have kept their commitments. It's the, the Palestinians that have been unable and unwilling to do so. And that has really made it uh, impossible. It's not the only reason Israel needs to take its responsibility as well, but, but it's an important reason why we haven't been able to get peace between uh, Israelis and Palestinians. And let me just make, if we've got a moment, one more point about this. When Rabin decided to make peace with the Palestinians and negotiated the Oslo Accords, he adopted Kissinger's step-by-step -step incremental approach. Few people remember this today. But the Oslo Accords did not specify any final status outcome. There's nothing about a Palestinian state, about Jerusalem, or about the refugees. It's all about a step-by-step -step process in which Israel would withdraw in three phrase, phases from Gaza and the West Bank, and then the borders would be negotiated and all the other final status issues would be negotiated. Only after this, this process led to a building of trust and a, um, uh, a willingness on the part of the Palestinians to reconcile. And we did not stick with Oslo after Rabin's assassination. And, and uh, Israel did not, and Barak did not. Instead, we abandoned it for the very thing that Chris Kissinger uh, warned about, which was an effort to resolve the conflict, to get the parties to end their conflict, something Kissinger would have never done. Thank you. Questions? Questions? We have a very, uh, the microphone coming around. Thank you. Um, would you care to comment on the current situation in Israel and perhaps a prediction? Thank you for that. <laughs> prediction, I'm not good at the predictions. Um, but uh, look, it's a deeply worrying situation. As I said at the beginning, Gail and I were there for 10 days. Uh, and I came back deeply troubled. I've never felt um, since 1973 um, that Israel's fate is hanging in the balance. Uh, and and it, it's uh, deeply troubling because the determination of Prime Minister Netanyahu to push his judicial revolution. And you know, people will say, well, he's dropped, he's put off most of the legislation, but he's insisting on con basically being able to stack the court. And, and he's insisting on that legislation uh, because everything else will flow from that. If he controls the judges, then he can go ahead with the rest of, of his effort to, to curb the independence of the judiciary. Uh, and that's a threat to Israel's democracy uh, in a very fundamental way. And, and there is a full-fledged revolt of civil society against that idea. Uh, and and it's, it's a phenomenon. I mean, <coughs> last night there were 200,000 uh, Israelis in, in, in the streets of Tel Aviv demonstrating against this. And another, I think, 150,000 around around the country. Uh, and and Gail and I were in those demonstrations on two Saturday nights in, in Tel Aviv. So I can report to you that this is this is is not a diverse crowd. There are no very few yarmulke wearing people there. Certainly no no payers or black hats. Um, but it is secular Israel, and it is veterans, and it is doctors and nurses and, and lawyers and, and reservists and, and young people. Who everybody said, oh, they, are, they don't vote, they just go to the beach. They're out there in large numbers, and, and old people and everywhere in between. And it's, you know, it's a typical Israeli crowd. They don't listen to to the speeches. <laughs> They're all milling around. 
Some of them are beating drums, which is a very tribal, I think, highly appropriate thing. They're, they're all these different groups with their drums, beating their drums. Um, but it is a, a deep commitment to Israel's democracy. And I couldn't help but, but, but think that, wow, we don't have that same commitment in this country. Our democracy was threatened, and we didn't come out in the streets like that. But they care about it, and they are going to uh, insist. Now, what happens in this situation? As you probably noticed, yesterday, the defence minister, Yoav Gallant, came out and said what is happening now is threatening the very existence of the state because reservists are refusing are warning that they will refuse a uh, call-up, including the elite units, including the, most of the pilots in the, the F-15 squadron that's responsible for Israel's long-range attack capability. That is to say, the ability to strike at Iran's nuclear um, capabilities. Those pilots, the actual elite of the elite, are saying we're not going to turn up because if this goes ahead. And, and so the defence minister, well, as I said, all of the previous heads of the security services, and I know from talking to them that the current heads of the security services feel exactly the same way, that this has got to stop that the legislation should not go ahead, that Netanyahu needs to back off, allow time for a cooling off and for a conversation about a way forward that would be based on a consensus rather than a confrontation. I don't know whether that's going to happen. Netanyahu seems to be determined to go ahead. And if he does uh, next week, well, actually, tomorrow, Monday, the, there could well be a vote. And if that vote wins, and it's not clear it will, because f three other Likud members of Knesset have now said that they will support Galant's call to, to freeze the process. And so four of them may not vote for it. And if that's the case, it may fail. But if... And, and if Netanyahu realises that, he may pull it at the last minute. But if he doesn't, and it goes forward, then we're f looking at a full-blown crisis in which uh, the Supreme Court is likely to issue an injunction to hold off on the implementation until they have a time to consider whether it's uh, legal or not that this legislation they're passing on the selection, how to select the judges. And, and then Netanyahu is going to have to decide whether he goes along with the injunction or not and, and convenes the committee and starts to set it up. At that point, there will be a widespread campaign of civil disobedience. Now, why is this so worrying? It's not just because of the deep division that's been created in Israel. It's because Israel's enemies are watching this and they see it and they see that weakness and, and that is deeply dangerous uh, for Israel. And just one last point here, which I think is really important, is, you know, we care about Israel's survival and well-being. Uh, but we're reluctant to speak out because we don't want to criticise Israel and let Israel's enemies take advantage of that. But this is affecting the US-Israel relationship. And it's not just because it's our shared democratic values that underpin the relationship. But it's also because if Israel's deterrence is undermined as a result of this division, then our dependence on Israel's deterrence for stabilising the region, go back to Kissinger, and the whole notion of maintaining order was all about giving Israel the strength to deter its enemies. 
if that strength is undermined by this, and it's happening, that's what the defense minister is warning about, then America's interests as well as its values are going to be directly impacted. And that's why I'm going to the rally <coughs> along with Rabbi Shankman to, to, today because I'm going there with a message that I want to convey to you too, which is that we have to speak out, not just for the sake of Israel's future, but for the sake of the US-Israel relationship. And we have to call on our leaders, including our leaders in our community, to speak out. And, and to President Biden, who's a true friend of Israel, to speak out and, and urge the Prime Minister to back off. Thank you. <clears throat> different take on the current situation, different question on the current situation. So what would Kissinger or Kissinger's approach make of a spring of 2023 in which America and Israel are increasingly at odds? Um, the, our other primary ally in that corner of the world, the pariah state, recently made, reached detente with the, our primary enemy in that corner of the world, a member of the axis of evil, with the aid of the second world superpower. Um, Egypt seems somewhat sidelined. Syria has preoccupied in other ways. The world he created 50 years ago, as you described, has been, uh, if not decimated, at least fundamentally stressed. So what would, and you seem to know his, the way you, you've talked to us about the way he thinks about these things, or you think about these things. So how does that new world uh, appeal to, no, how does that, how does he or that kind of thinking react to a world evolving in that way? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Thank you. He's, he's deeply distressed about it. He's deeply distressed that China is managed to come in and pull off this diplomatic coup uh, as with the help of our erstwhile ally, Saudi Arabia. It wouldn't have happened if Saudi Arabia hadn't invited China to, to do this deal. Basically, the deal was done before the Chinese swooped in, but the, it was the Saudis that, that provided that entree. Uh, and and um, he's deeply worried about what's happening in Israel. Uh, because Kissinger always saw the fragility of Israel. Uh, it's why he, and this is a subtext to the book, because how Kissinger as, as a Jew dealt with the Jewish state. But he was supremely conscious of its fragility. And it's why he developed this approach of territory for time. Because he, he did not want to do what Nixon and, and Ford wanted to, him to do, which was to pressure Israel to return to the 67 borders in one go. Um, and, and he felt that that was very dangerous for Israel. Not because of the vulnerability of the 67 borders and so on, because of the pressure, that the pressure would break Israel. And, and so now he, you know, is again deeply concerned about the, the fragility of Israel. But he's also concerned about the um, way in which uh, the Biden administration and the Republicans are together uh, putting, his, putting China in a, in, in a situation where they move closer to Russia. Kissinger would have never, you know, his whole policy of detente and the breakthrough to China was to separate China from Russia and to be able to play between the two of them. And so he's, he, he, he thinks that's a, a big mistake. And he thinks it's a mistake that, that but this is typically typical of Kissinger, uh, he thinks it's a mistake to put our values ahead of our interests, as we do with China, as we do with 
with Russia and as we do uh, in the Middle East more generally. Um, hi, thank you for your, your remarks. I was curious, you made a comment at the very beginning about Nixon's re or Kissinger's relationship with Nixon and Nixon's anti-Semitism. And I was wondering if you could just say a word about that. And also, you talked about his relationship with others in the State Department. And I've always wondered, like listening to the Nixon tapes when he talks about stuff, and I was like, how did he possibly pick Kissinger? And how did Kissinger manage to stay so central? So if you could just say a word about that. Yeah, it's, um, I, I can't do it in one word. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, look, Nixon um, was an anti-Semite in I mean, his attitude towards Jews. And yet he appointed a Jew as his national security advisor, be his closest advisor when it came to foreign policy, which was his, you know, a very big part of his uh, foreign, of his uh, uh, policy as president. Um, and that was, you know, a kind of contradiction in, in Nixon. But when it came to the Middle East, Nixon told Kissinger, you stay away from that because you're Jewish. Well, you know, he basically made it clear to Kissinger that he didn't trust him to deal with the Middle East because of his Jewishness. Uh, and he said, you know, we'll leave that to, to the State Department and Bill Rogers, Secretary of State. We're going to do the whole rest of the world, but you are not to, to go near that. Of course, that was the red flag to Kissinger, to Kissinger's pool. I mean, he, he then spent two years undermining Rogers and, and, and so exasperating Nixon that Nixon finally said, all right, you take it, take, take the Middle East as well. Um, but, but that's, you know, gives you a sense of the environment in which Kissinger was sus his suspected of dual loyalty. Um, and so that was the reason that Kissinger obfuscated a lot of what he was doing when it came to Israel. I think it's also the reason, and I don't mean to justify this, but I think it, 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 it's the explanation for why he is cited in those tapes, as you're probably aware, of saying some pretty anti-Semitic things himself, Kissinger, about how putting Russian Jews, Soviet Jews in, in the ovens is not an interest of the United States, maybe a humanitarian concern. So. Uh, but that was because he was with, mixing it up with the boys <coughs> in the White House. Now, in the State Department, he was surrounded by bureaucrats who regarded Israel as a liability. And he did not. He didn't share that, but he wasn't going to tell them that. So he was constantly maneuvering Nixon, Ford, and the State Department, his advisors, Joe Sisko, Hal Saunders, and so on, to, to try to... Uh, protect Israel, uh, but to do it in a way that um, put Israel in the situation where it was advancing American interests. None of this value stuff, as I said before, American interests. And, and, and to develop the idea, which subs subsequently became the foundations of, of the relationship, of the strategic relationship that a strong Israel was in America's interest. And, and you know, as I detail in the book, he did all sorts of things uh, under the radar that weren't so obvious uh, to ensure um, Israel's strength, including massive uh, supply of assistance, uh, military assistance, uh, after the second Sinai disengagement agreement, which laid the foundations for the massive assistance that Israel gets from the United States today. Um, so, you know, in our community, he's remembered for something else, which is that he held up the weapons to Israel in the 73 war. And so he has a bad rap because of that. As I show in the book, in fact, it's that that's not what happened. Uh, I won't go into all the, all the details. Read the book. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it's not... Uh, it's not true, and it's, his, his approach was far more consistent with what I'm, what I'm saying in the war as, as in the aftermath. So he was a fundamentally pro-Israel uh, in, in what he did for Israel. And if you read the biographies of the Israelis who dealt with him at the time, they say exactly that, 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 that they owe a debt to Kissinger.
we have a, a, one more question, and then we'll oh we'll end it. Uh, we have to end I'm it. gonna I'm gonna let you pick who gets that last question because there are many hands here. How okay, about an Israeli? Answer, uh, <laughs> Mark Newman gets the last okay. question. Thanks for being here. Um, you mentioned Kissinger taking all of his papers. Um, you were in a situation where you were brought in uh, to essentially be on top of the State Department. Does this sort of suggest that the State Department really is never capable as an organization of profound peacemaking, diplomacy? We see this you know, even with the Abraham Accords, with Jared Kushner and all these people on top of that. Um, based on Kissinger's experience, did he think that the State Department was his back office, or um, does he sort of see it as a useful tool which is very limited? Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, it, you know, Kissinger was ambivalent about it. Um, he, uh, he, he thought the State Department writ, la writ large was just useless, uh, as did Nixon. And, and so when he was national security advisor, he, he was basically doing everything he could to cut the State Department out of his, his diplomatic efforts. Uh, he had a team of, of very smart, mostly Jewish uh, advisors in, in the National Security Council, and that, that's what he depended on. And they ran foreign policy out of, out of the White House. When he became Secretary of State, uh, he then had to work with, with the State Department. And uh, he discovered that actually there are a lot of very talented people there. Uh, and and he, he used them. Uh, Joe Sisko, Hal Saunders, Ray Atherton, some of you may, may uh, know these people. They were deeply knowledgeable about the Middle East and Henry knew nothing about the Middle East. I mean, he knew about Israel. He traveled to Israel six times before he became national security advisor. He'd never stepped foot in the Arab world. He only went on his first visit to any Arab country after the Yom Kippur War, when he, when he started his peace diplomacy. Uh, so he depended on these guys. And, and uh, they, as, as highly professional uh, public servants, notwithstanding their own biases, uh, really backstopped him and did a huge amount of the work uh, under his guidance. Now he, you know, often throw tantrums and stomp on their uh, papers and demand that they rewrite it and so on. But, but um, I know that he couldn't, he knows, he, he would admit that he couldn't have done it without them. Um, so it's, it's, it's a combination. They came to it with a set of assumptions that he didn't share. Um, but they fell in line with, with his approach and came to appreciate it because it succeeded. On that um, note, uh, on, on, on that note, we're going to give people the opportunity to, to, for you to sign some books and for all of us to thank you collectively for a terrific uh, talk, which we, we really enjoyed. And uh, you're, you're great. Thank you. We, we know that there are a couple more hours of questions, so we, uh, and we're going to invite you to not ask them uh, during the book signing, only because I know that Ambassador Indick will have to get to the rally. Apparently, he has the, because of who he is, he can come when, whenever he's ready to come. I have to be there a little bit earlier. Uh, and uh, I just I encourage you to, um, to purchase the book, and then we can have some additional discussions. We're, we're going to continue talking about what's happening in Israel. We have lots of upcoming conversations planned, as well as our, our next Amram series scholar is, uh, Amram scholar series author is Andrew Lawler, uh, who wrote a book under Jerusalem. So if we're going to really dig beneath the surface to, um, to understand a little bit more of the history and we know that there are lots of conversations remaining, especially as we approach Israel's 75th. We'll have uh, opportunities to celebrate as a congregation in April, um, April 21st. 
uh, there's a service when we will um, when we will be celebrating Israel's 75th, and we also do that with a little bit of trepidation, knowing that uh, that sovereign rule, that Israel as a as a modern day institution, but in our history, um, has really only lasted 70 to 80 years. This moment is such a critical moment in uh, in our history and in our future as a Jewish people, and so. That is why many of us are going to stand at the Israeli embassy today to ensure that we continue uh, in this, uh, this project, whether we call it that, but, uh, but that we continue to fight for the soul of Israel and the Jewish people. They're so intricately connected. And so I wanna thank all of you for being here because clearly you care about Israel. And I wanna thank Ambassador Indik again for his time and uh, knowledge and expertise. We are so, so grateful. And Dan, as always, thank you as well. Thank you. So.